What makes a song a smash? Talent, luck, timing, all that and more. On Hit Parade from Slate, host Chris Melanthi tells tales from a half century of chart history. Through storytelling, trivia, and song snippets, Chris dissects how the artists you love or hate dominated the airwaves and shaped your memories forever. He's explained how Taylor Swift pivoted from country to pop, how The Cure got UK goth rock onto US radio, and how a young Stevie Wonder improvised his way to a Billboard chart topper. Subscribe to Hit Parade for tales of the hits from coast to coast, wherever you are listening right now. Hey friends, before we get started, I want to suggest another podcast we thought you might appreciate that also explores the complexity of immigrant experience. It's called Immigrantly, and it's hosted by the social entrepreneur and rights activist Sadia Khan. I had a wonderful conversation with Sadia recently about this podcast you're listening to right now. So you can find that in their feed along with many other conversations. Again, it's called Immigrantly. Okay, on with our show. Where did the love of percussion begin for you? It just just started like on the streets of Cuba, you know. I used to go down to a friend of mine, his name uh, is Manolo. And so right on the corner, there was a bus stop. And next to it, there was a little park. And there were always some older gentlemen sitting in there always telling stories but with music you know Mm. it was sort of like a battle of boleros of ballads right (laughs) but they were always do it rumba style Mm. if you think of a of whatever ballad from cuba you know cuando tomate la firme decisión de irte right all that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. but then they would be doing it like and then they'll be battling it out, you know. And then somebody will be standing there saying, No lo vire, no lo vire, which means don't turn it, don't take it into the mambo or to the chorus, you know. <laughs> Keep it going. Mm. I was just to stand there and listen to them for a little bit. And then I would continue on my way. You know, as I walk down the street, people will be singing either bembe or playing bata drums. So I had this kind of journey where I heard all these different things prior to getting to Manolo's house, which is where we had a drum set up made out of cans. Mm. <laughs> so, but we would go like for hours and hours just banging on these things literally every day. Music is about energy about transforming rhythm or melody into feelings that communicate, drawing a listener in. But there are some musicians who do the exact same thing with stories, and you can spot them right away. Jesus Diaz has got this way of telling a story that brings you to an exact moment in life, where you can feel the place he's talking about, sense the humidity in the air, see the street in your mind. Now, when I encounter an artist like this, I think, you know, this is the kind of person you want with you on a tour bus when you are spending countless hours driving from gig to gig. The art of the story is in his bones, just like the pulse is. Jesus is a multi-instrumentalist, vocalist, composer, arranger, educator, audio engineer, and a storyteller. He plays music for dancing, music for ancestral connection. He's rocked stages with folks like Stevie Wonder, built his own bands, QBA, and Talking Drums. For him, the Bay Area is home. That's where he raised his children and found himself as an artist. But Cuba is his deepest root. My name is Maclit, and this is Movement. (laughs) 
so like rewind it for a second because like when i'm when i'm in mm-hmm. that moment i'm thinking wait a minute in this moment you already know how to play was there something that mm-hmm. happened before that like like how did you learn what was your learning moment was it or was it not learning it was just immersion and a kind of you know uh an expression of that immersion you know my my uh my stepdad rest in peace he had a band and so what they did they started to rehearse at my house every week mm-hmm. and the kind of music that they play was danzón and cha 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 mm-hmm. you know danzón is like the perfect marriage of european music and african music you know what i mean because it's you know you have cellos and violins and flute and you have the timbales which comes from the timpani and you have the only indigenous instrument left in Cuba that is originally from there, which is the widow, mm-hmm. right? The gourd that you scrape with the stick, mm-hmm. right? And so up to that point, I had only been exposed to like, ah, oh, you know, the rumbas at the corner, the bembe down the street, and me banging on drums with my friends. But it wasn't until I was exposed to my stepfather's band rehearsing on the house that I started visualizing music a little bit differently, right? And then I would be like, hey, I want to play, I want to play, I want to be I want to be in the band. And they were like, the conga player would say to me, all right, we're going to let you play one song, you know? And so you have to play straight time, and this is your pattern. Mm-hmm. Just that, the entire time. Of course, I had zero discipline, so I would play for a little bit, and then I would want to play some crazy stuff, and I'd be like, no, that's it, you're done. And they will never let me play again that day. And I was like, darn it. So that went on for, you know, quite some time, probably like at least over a month. And then I remember vividly my mom saying, you know, to me at that point, she said, look, if you want to play music, and if you want to be a part of the rhythm session and play percussion, your main job is to play time. Right. Forget about all this, you know, fancy, crazy chops and all that stuff, because if you have no discipline, nobody will call you. So I learned that from my mom. And then I started to play actually with the band. Mm. And so that was kind of like a home thing. You see what I'm saying? It wasn't like, oh, I went to the music right. school and I learned how to... I learned how to read. You know, I didn't learn any of that up until I came to the States. Right, right. I was wondering if you could tell us the story of how you left Cuba. Okay. So um, in 1980, there was a something called the Mariel Boat Lift. Between midnight and noon today, 23 boats filled with over 800 Cubans reached Key West, Florida. U.S. Marines are Jimmy Carter was the president of the United States at the time. I'd like to make a statement to you and to the nation. And um, Jimmy Carter and other countries in Latin America said, okay, people who are not happy with the Cuban government can leave and we'll take some people. Castro himself has refused to permit them a safe and orderly passage. So the deal was, I learned this, this after I was in America, right? The deal was that people that had um, families in Cuba were then allowed to go to Cuba with their boats and pick up their family members. Mm. However, the Cuban government said, you want to pick up your family, you have to take as many people as we can put on your boat. Wow. If you don't want to do that, don't come to get your family. Vessels like this one, the Dr. Daniels, were forced to take far more passengers than it has safety equipment for. So you had all these little tiny boats, right? The people that came over to pick up their family. You know, maybe a 25-passenger boat was leaving Cuba with, you know, 75 people, 100 people overloaded, right? Backing up boats in the refugee-crowded port of Mariel. So at that time, unfortunately... I was incarcerated. I was in prison in Cuba for, uh, you know, protesting against things that I, you know, wasn't in agreement with. I was in my cell and I just called my name. 
So basically, it's just think of a very long and skinny warehouse, right? So I was like my cell. And so what happened in Cuba when you were in prison, the, the way they run their system, every so often they move you to a different prison because they don't want you to get too comfortable in a place so you can figure out how to escape or get away or anything like that. So at the beginning, when they start calling people by name, everybody starts grabbing whatever they own, which is not much, of course, but you have some things, right? You start grabbing your stuff. Are you thinking, I'm about to get moved to go somewhere else? So I started calling people by name and everybody started grabbing their things and they're like, no, leave your stuff in there. And they will leave and never come back. So some of us who are being left in the cell, we have no clue what exactly is happening, but we know that these people are not coming back. So of course we are speculating. Okay, what, what are they doing? Are they killing people? You know, what's happening? We don't know. So became more and more empty, less and less people. So when I came out, I was nervous because I had no idea what was waiting for me outside. So they took me into, you know, the office of the people in charge and say, have a seat. And uh, now, we were, you know, I asked what's going on? Why am I here? And they were like, you know, we want you to sign this piece of paper because we are going to send you out of the country. And I said, leaving to go where? And then they said, you're going to uh, America, to the U.S. Don't you, don't you want to go to the U.S.? And I was like, no. I don't want to go to America. I don't have family there. You know, I don't speak the language. What would I do there? And they were like, well, we don't know, but you're going. And, you know, before they put us in the boat, there was, they gave us this, the, the spiel of, you, you know, you will never allow to step back in this country again. You know, when you go to America, you know, you are going to have a difficult time. It's not going to be what you think, you know, white people hate black people and blah, blah, blah. It's the land of hate and you're going to get what's coming. That's pretty much what the message oh was. Oh my you God. Know? And they put us on this boat. And then I remember literally one of the few things that I, my mind was never, was never able to block was the view that I was sitting on this boat looking as Cuba got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And then I was in the middle of the water and I couldn't see any land, right? <laughs> so I'm sitting on the roof of the boat, right? Because there were too many people on the boat. I mean, the people, boats were overloaded with people. And then a storm came. And so I remember sitting on the top of this boat and saying, well, shit. I guess this is it, you know, I'm going to die. That was literally what I thought. I was like, I'm done. I was sitting on this boat thinking about all this stuff. And then we got rescued by the, the United States Coast Guard. So that's how I came here. You know, I uh, I turned 18 in the, in the U.S. But when I came to the, the U.S. It was like two weeks before my 18th birthday. Wow. And I, I, when I first got here, I went through uh, the state of Florida, like most people. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up in the Bay Area, and I've been here since. And San Francisco was the place where you really, or the Bay Area was the place where you really became a professional musician in the States, right? Yes. Yes. And how did that leap happen? Well, um, it took a very long time. Mm. It didn't happen overnight. When I first got to the Bay Area, my main concern was, how do I get get a job and have a roof over my head? Yes. Because I was really having a hard time. I didn't have a place to live. I didn't have any money. I didn't have anything. So I wasn't really thinking at the time about playing music. I was thinking mm -hmm. about surviving. Yes. You know? I was washing dishes in a restaurant and I was pumping gas at a gas station. And so now that allowed me to have a little bit of money so that I can, you know, rent a room in a crappy hotel in, in the Mission District, you know? But it was better than being on the streets, yes. you know? I learned how to be a mechanic, and I, I ended up working for the city of San Francisco. I worked for Muni. I worked at City Hall. I worked at the San Francisco Public Library. I did a lot of, I had a lot of city jobs with benefits. Mm -hmm. I'm making good money. So I went from, like, you know, being homeless and having nothing to working with for the city of San Francisco and having 
health insurance and retirement plan. Wow. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> right? So, but all this, I wanted to play music. So at that time, when I, when I was already like set and okay, I got my place to live, I got money, you know, I got a job. Now I want to play drums. So I went to the store in San Francisco called the Hate Asbury Music Store. And I went there and I, the, the owner of the store is Masu, who's a really, really nice gentleman. And, you know, we started talking. Oh, where are you from? I'm from Cuba. And we started talking, started asking all these questions. We developed a little bit of a friendship, him and I. And he was like, oh, you know, I'll give you a discount. And I bought two drums from him. My very first drums, the half top of the drum was red and the bottom was white. Mm. At that time, there was a, a great, the great late Francisco Aguabella. Yes. Very, very famous Cuban percussionist. You know, I went to see him play, and then, you know, I was like, Francisco, can you give me some lessons? You know, I want to, you know, how do, how, do, how do I play music in a band here, you know? And he was like, no, 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 no. I don't have time. You know, too busy. You can't just... You can't just pick up and say you want to be a musician. I said, no, you know, I, yeah, yeah, I've been doing music my whole life, but, you know, I just wanted some some guidance. We're like, I, I don't have time. He didn't want to teach me. And then there was another local Cuban percussionist. His, his name happens to be Manolo <laughs> as well, ironically. <laughs> and so he was a very good cocker player. And I went to him and he was like, oh, you know, the same thing. Nobody had time. Wow. I was like, man, this is crazy. Nobody wants to teach me. I was like, all right, fine, no problem. I'm going to start practicing on my own. Both records and started listening to music, and I started practicing and learning every day. Play along. And then I met a gentleman by the name of Luis Cespedes, who was part of a family that had a Afro-Cuban band in the Bay Area. Yes. Called Conjunto Cespedes. Yes. And... Their nephew was the conga player in the band. Unfortunately, something happened. He got really sick and he passed away. And Luis Cespedes came to me and he says, hey, man, why don't you come and play in the band? And I was like, you know, Conjunto Cespedes was already like an established group, you know, and they had, you know, a lot of gigs. And so I was like, I don't know if I'm ready. You know, I said, I don't know if I'm ready to be in the band, you know. And he goes, yeah, you can do it. He said, here's the music. Learn this. And I played one gig with them, and he was like, yep, you the guy. So, you know, we were doing all these tours and things, and we're going to go to Europe. And I went to my job, and I said, I need a leave of absence, you know, for three months. And my boss looked at me, and he goes, are you crazy? He goes, I can't give you that much time. You know, we, who's going to do your job? And I was like, I don't know, but I need that. I, I don't even need to get paid. I just want to be able to go and come back. And he said, no, we can't do it. The most time I can give you is 30 days. I was like, I need three months, man. I can't, 30 days is not going to do it. No, well, 30 days is all I can give you. And I was like, well, I'm going to have to write a letter of resignation. And he goes, yeah, sure. You're not going to do that. Do you know how many people want your job? He says, you got benefits, you got retirement, you're making good money, you got the freedom to do whatever you want. Nobody wants to leave this job. And I said, I will leave this job if you don't give me the time that I need. So he refused to give it to me. And so I went home. And I wrote a letter of resignation, and the next day I came back to my job and I gave it to him. And he looked at me and he goes, I can't believe you're doing this. Are you crazy? Are you sure you want to do this? And he goes, yep. I say, yeah, I want to do it. And he goes, you know, I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you sleep on this. I'm not even going to turn this letter in. And I said, do it because I'm going to quit the job. <laughs> As a child, I always wanted to play music. And I said, I'm going to give myself an opportunity to play music, you know. And so I quit my job. And to this day, it was the craziest thing that I ever did and the best thing that I ever did mm. at the same time. I mean, who would, who would have thought, right? I'm, I'm 
small little kid from a small town in Cuba, Reparto Bue, Arroyo Naranjo, you know, come to America, you know, I play with, you know, the Dave Matthews Band, Stevie Wonder, uh, recorded music for movies, commercials, have endorsements with companies that, that make instruments with my name on them. I'm not rich, but I can pay my rent, my mortgage, I should say. So I'm doing all right for myself because, you know, I'm happy with what I do. To this day, have you ever been back to Cuba? You know, when I, when I came from Cuba in 1980, I was not able to go to Cuba for 20 years. They didn't let me in. The Cuban government didn't let me in. And so 20 years later, I went to Cuba for the very, very, very first time. And it was one of the most difficult experiences that in my lifetime, because it was kind of like reliving, you know, sometimes the human body will take things that are hurtful to you and hide them in a very special place, right? So they don't hurt you anymore, but it's still there. And so in many ways, you almost like you get amnesia and you forgot about all these different things because your body doesn't want to remember these things because it's a painful experience, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And so for many years, in order for me to survive, I had to hide a lot of things. You know what I mean? I even get sentimental about it, talking about it right now. So when I went to Cuba 20 years later, it was shocking. It's like, you know, going back, it was like going back in time and reliving all my experiences and all the pain and all the loneliness and all this and that, it was, man, it was really hard. Mm. Really, really, really hard. Yeah, yo. I go there to get in touch with a certain energy that is on the ground. You see what I'm saying? I go there to connect with my ancestors. I go there to connect with my family and my roots. Because no matter what happens or what any government may or may not do, they can never take that away because that's always going to be there. You know what I'm saying? That connection and the link to the people that, will be, that walked this earth before you will always be there. And that's why I go to Cuba for When I go there, I charge myself with that ancestry energy to continue to face the world and continue to move forward. You can learn more about Jesus at jesusdiazqba.com or listen to him wherever you stream your music. Movement is produced by Ian Koss and myself, Mekli Tadero. Our co-creator and podcast godmother is Julie Kane. Our broadcast partner is The World. We are supported by the National Geographic Society and distributed by PRX. Yeah, yeah, my dear, oh, 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 oh,
You know, more people should play music and then they'd be a lot happier. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm crying out loud, man. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. Anyways, I'm sorry if I took a left turn out of Albuquerque there, but. <laughs> You know, it's like a big long chain. They keep connecting the links, you know? Yes, indeed. That's how you tell the story. 